Bienvenidos a esta sesión sobre el... Welcome to the session about economic realism in Latin America. I'm happy to moderate the session with four very important panelists. My name is Mauricio Cárdenas. I'm professor at the University of Colombia. Um, I'll introduce the panelists. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, Diana Mondino, uh, has just uh, been uh, assigned uh, this uh, her, her mandate. This is one of her first uh, international appearances. The uh, governor of the state of Baja California, Marina del Pilar Avila. We're really uh, very, very honored to have you here. The pr president of the governor of the Central Bank of Peru, Julio Velarde, and Luis Enrique Guimaraes, who's member of the board of important businesses in Brazil, like Cozan uh, uh, Distribution uh, Business. Uh, and of Bali, the um, energy business in Argentina, company in Argentina. So it's a large panel with many perspectives, uh, views, and countries represented here. We're going to start with Julio Velarde, who's been uh, governor of the Central Bank of Peru since 2006. He has been on his job, and he's seen eight presidents <laughs> of the country. So we always uh, say so in uh, conversations around uh, Peruvian economy. But he's always um, been in important um, functions. I'd like to start with you asking what is going on with Latin American economy. Is the uh, glass have, en have empty or have full? Which is your uh, um, view going forward? Uh, what is the context at a national, international level? And what are the countries that should be mentioned in this conversation? Thank you very much for this question. Maybe we should start talking about inflation first. After the 80s, many of the Latin American countries learned that there are many crises. I don't think, uh, I think that there's a country who's learning so and is being successful. We know that inflation rates have gone up. Uh, in the world, and the countries should react m more uh, um, quicker than the rest of the world. Brazil in, um, in uh, decided that inflation was uh, transient, and inflation uh, got to two figures in Colombia, Brazil, and Chile, and it was up to 7 or 8.7 in Mexico and Peru, 8.8 8 in Peru. And maybe we were less aggressive than the rest of them, as uh, Colombia and Brazil, they put up rates more than the rest. Chile and Mexico uh, got to two uh, uh, figures. But the good news is that inflation is decreasing. Colombia is, has still a high inflation, but the uh, recent uh, figures are quite positive. And m many countries are still waiting uh, to uh, get to a good momentum. Chile is expecting to achieve its goal. It has already done so, but it expects to uh, keep there. Chile has decreased its interest rates for 4.5 at the end of this year. Peru has already decreased five times its interest rates, 7.75. Now it's uh, six uh, and something. And apparently for another country, it'll be 4%. Uh, percent. In Colombia, uh, inflation will also decrease. And the case of Mexico is quite clear to Mexico without having such a uh, high inflation has reacted very, very quickly. And this as for inflation. Um, the banks are autonomous and inflation, which uh, uh, frightened everybody, um, is now under control. But growth is a problem. I think that the reforms were carried out in the 90s, but then they have been forgotten. In Brazil, there was an impulse with the um, last um, economic uh, finance uh, minister. Uh, but there has been a certain stagnation in the largest economy. Mexico has grown this century 2% a year, a little bit less. And poverty with Lopez Obrador and everything he has done uh, decreased under 2% uh, during these uh, recent 20 years, which is less than other countries. Brazil, after the first Lula's government, almost stagnated for a long time, but then it increased 
these recent years. And now with the fiscal reform, apparently things are going better. But we need reforms. We need reforms in the region. And we have bureaucratized ourselves, and we're over-regulated. Uh, when we leave uh, public officials the power to do whatever they want, everybody thinks that his ministry uh, is more important than the rest, and he or she starts to over-regulate uh, with several reasons. But then the business environment is each is less and less friendly. And this is not only going on in Latin America, but in the rest of the world. Thank you very much. Yes, I think that there are two uh, success cases, which were countries like Brazil and Mexico, which had a low uh, growth rate. But other countries are really growing now, Peru, Colombia, Chile. So the success in, in Brazil and Mexico recently is something to be highlighted. Uh, Minister, we have just listened to President uh, Millet here in Davos with all of his ideas and libertarian ideas. And completing the uh, this president's speech, which is the strategy that the new government in Argentina will implement uh, f to attract foreign investment uh, in Argentina and for Argentina to accelerate its international insertion, which is the strategy that you have conceived. Well, this has not been rehearsed, but I will uh, go back to what has just been said. The interest rate in Argentina that you have just said, 7.75 in Argentina, it was 300% at the end of November. Now, in just one month, it has uh, gone down to 100 and something. So it's almost half of what it was some time ago. So what we're wanting to do in Argentina now is an enormous, a huge process simultaneous to reduce inflation and deregulate uh, to allow a growth uh, and development. Both things are necessary. Without, I mean, with inflation, we cannot grow. But without inflation alone, we cannot do anything either. So to grow, to be able to grow, investment, uh, foreign uh, direct investment is uh, essential because we're talking here about larger amounts, and they bring in technology, and they bring a corporate governance, and other things that are not only money and that contribute to this, and they give access to markets. So all those things have to be uh, achieved simultaneously. In Argentina, we have a very important need to reduce uh, public expenses. We had a 15% deficit in uh, GDP in 2023. So uh, public expense uh, needs to be uh, reduced. Um, the uh, foreign investment is, of course, almost zero because with um, rates of that nature, it's almost impossible. No uh, consumption, of course. So the best way to grow is through exports. And the best way to grow through exports is not only with the efforts carried out by Argentinians, but also with foreign direct investment. And uh, we're making an effort to uh, level the uh, play field uh, for Argentinian businesses and foreign businesses, which was not the case. So everybody, uh, Argentine people and, and foreigners, uh, will be able to invest. But in uh, the foreign investment, we need to consider it from different viewpoints. Not only money, but also technology, uh, ways of working. Uh, so we're not only um, working on the economic uh, uh, level, but we're also starting a process to um, access to uh, OECD. It's a long process. It'll take several years. But we're starting to take into account the restrictions, regulations, and benefits that exist in more developed countries. If we want to have the same development level uh, as the rest of the countries, we need to do the same things. Uh, I congratulate you uh, for the decision of trying to uh, access uh, the OECD because that was uh, one of the main uh, objectives of my government. Uh, this helps uh, to um, promote many initiatives to get better standards. And the process itself is as helpful as the conclusion. The process is really very uh, enriching. And if we want to um, improve uh, public policies, that's a good way. Yes, now, uh, Governor. Marina del Pilar Avila, you have been a mayor to uh, Mexicali and you're a deputy, uh, a member of parliament, so you have done lots of things in politics. Let's talk about the role of the uh, state of Baja California in the process of 
uh, benefiting from the opportunities of uh, nearshoring? What are the lessons that you can give for other states in Mexico and for other countries in Latin America uh, to uh, take advantage of the circumstance uh, that has to do with the changes in global um, trade trends? Yes, of course. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here to speak with all of you. I would uh, like to start talking about what's going on in Mexico now. We are becoming the first commercial partner of the United States. We have an economic growth which is really important, 3.6 percent. These last months, uh, Baja California has become one of the states with a, a higher economic growth. The peso is one of the currencies that has increased in value compared to the dollar. The minimum wage in Mexico is one of the um, highest that has, has, has had a highest growth in uh, the world, and it's one of the countries with less unemployment. So there's something that's going on. Nearshoring is here now. We cannot even believe it. But in Baja California, is something that we've been doing for a very long time already due to the endogenous uh, circumstances, uh, the geographical situation, our border with California and with Arizona, and something that we already know. Nearshoring, well, everybody speaks about nearshoring. It's a sexy word, as I say, because everybody speaks about nearshoring. So to be a governor, as I am, of a border state like Baja California, with a border that where there is a, dyn, uh, a regional dynamics as important as this one, with California, with the Pacific Ocean, which, uh, um, which is very near uh, Asia, well, we are uh, benefiting from that and we're promoting our state. And this has led us to uh, promote talent. The uh, investors look for talent today. We have more than 90 universities in Baja California specifically, and the economic policy of uh, President Lopez Obrador has allowed for the strengthening of um, national uh, policies and confidence of investors. 80% of experts today, today we're talking about the importance of experts, 80% of experts in our country are towards the United States. So we are the first commercial partner for, uh, or trade partner for the United States, even before China. 15.5% of exports uh, to the United States come from Mexico and from China only 13 and something percent. So this is very attractive for uh, uh, international businesses that are looking at Baja California. There are huge investments there and investments are the uh, um, are, uh, growth drivers. Without investments, we cannot speak about uh, growth, uh, and we cannot speak about growth without a welfare policy, which um, President Obrador has been promoting too. So when we speak about uh, growth, economic growth without uh, um, econ um, social policies, well, uh, that, uh, you know, it's absolutely essential. Now, um, manpower is no longer cheap. Huh? Um, the private sector, uh, academia, and the public sector are partnering. So this is a very interesting moment for nearshoring. That's something we already do. We know how to do it, focusing on um, key investments, semiconductors, biotechnologies, medical tourism. We are the most important region in Mexico uh, for um, medical tourism, which has developed a lot in recent years. And we're not looking here to uh, um, isolated countries. It's Calibaja, it's a region where 8 million inhabitants live and we share uh, labor. Thousands of people cross uh, daily uh, the border. They live in Tijuana and other uh, cities, and they work in California, San Diego. So we have uh, an innovation corridor, the uh, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, San Diego, Tijuana, and it goes along Baja California. And of course, the fact of being connected to California, that opens the door to the United States. And we know that it's a matter, it's not only a, a trade competitiveness issue, but also of uh, security. So global businesses in Mexico have found a place where they feel comfortable to invest in. And that's something we are seeing now. And there is confidence And us in Baja California. We cannot just stay. Uh, to see and wait. Ooh, these uh, investors that are very interested, well, we're there. Uh, Luis Enrique, Mexico has a long success story 
uh, associated to nearshoring. Brazil is also uh, recovering this thanks to uh, foreign investment, the private sector investment in Brazil, businesses in Brazil. So what do you think are the factors that are generating this um, economic momentum? And what is the picture, the, the landscape for uh, Brazilian businesses going forward? Good enough. But, uh, but uh, I, I just picking up the first point of the president of the Central Bank of Peru, I think inflation, of course, in Brazil has reduced dramatically. Interest rates, which have peaked more than any other country, and control the inflation mm -hmm. also coming coming down and ignite a new cycle of investment. The other thing that's very important, I think the, the government is having a more open policy for global agreements and, and leading a greener agenda, which is very beneficial, I think, for the whole of Latin America, but especially for Brazil. I think Brazil have a couple of sectors that are critical for the global economy, and especially the new geopolitical between US and China and the whole, whole dilemmas we are living and discussing here in the forum, which are very important. Agriculture, Brazil is the leading agricultural frontier with enormous gain in terms of productivity and the growth of 3% last year, a, a good part came from the agricultural sector. And the improvements in logistics that have happened through the private investments in railroads and improvements on the concessions on roads, etc. I think the second one is oil and gas. Brazil is very competitive on oil and gas with pre-salt and it's becoming one of the largest producers of, of oil and gas in the world, and with a very low sulfur content, which again for decarbonization or the, the energy transition, very important. The third one is mining, right, with the iron ore reserves that Brazil have, copper reserves, and the importance again of high quality iron ore for, for the green steel and the whole transition that the hard to base segments we need to have. And, and the fourth one is renewable energy, right? So Brazil is probably the paradise for biofuels, right? With ethanol uh, uh, important for 40% of whole the mobility uh, uh, sector and biodiesel growing very well. And we see a new wave of investments on bio products in Brazil, especially second generation ethanol, which is done from the leftovers of the, of the process of producing sugar and ethanol, the bagasse and the leaves, which will go straight to SAF, the sustainable aviation fuel, which will enable aviation to be decarbonized over time. Biogas is also growing a lot from the liter uh, uh, process and, and also from the, 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 the sugar cane and the, and the big uh, 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 pig and, 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 and chicken production that Brazil has. So when you look at overall that, I think Brazil is very well positioned to benefit from the whole decarbonization and a transition wave. And the investments are coming from the private sector. It, it, the government is enabled, so the, the, you're just seeing the beginning of this year, you're seeing a lot of new legislation. So you're seeing the carbon market, the what they call the future fuels uh, agenda. You see the investment for the energy transition, the hydrogen uh, uh, law. So Brazil really is looking for this to enable the growth and having high quality jobs and talents that will be available. So we are very optimistic about 2024 should be a great year. Excellent. Excellent. So the main issue here uh, in Brazil is in the face of all the global issues, global crisis, uh, climate change, uh, food crisis, energy crisis. Well, Brazil is part of the solution and businesses in Brazil understand it perfectly well and they are investing to produce more food, to produce uh, renewable energies and uh, fossil fuels too. Um, Brazil has increased its production and at the end of this century it will uh, reach 5 million uh, barrels. So it's an important source of revenue. But so, so it's really focused on private sector. Let's now start another round of questions. I would like to go back to Julio Velarde to see a bit more in detail the situation in Peru. Every economic conversation uh, uh, that has to do with Peru leads us to the central bank because the central bank has been able to control inflation and to control the uh, exchange rate. We have uh, um, devaluations have been avoided. Uh, so it's a success case in these macroeconomic aspects. But on the other hand, Peru has an enormous potential that uh, it cannot have, uh, it cannot, um, that it, 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 it didn't um, benefit. So because of political and, and institutional uh, factors, a lot of 
political instability. How do you resolve? How do, how do you solve this problem? How do uh, you find a solution to take advantage of all these opportunities, all the uh, potential that uh, Peru has in this world, where um, ore and, and minerals in general are uh, so needed now? Peru has lots of reserves. Up to uh, 2014, there were four countries, Panama, Dominican Republic, and Peru, that were very important. Now, the Dominican Republic is uh, growing less than before, but it's still growing a lot. In Peru, the uh, political instability is a, a huge uh, issue that has had an impact in uh, growth. In 2016, we have had a succession of governments within the constitutional uh, rules, of course. In 2016, uh, in the second round, we had two uh, candidates that came from the right, uh, a more liberal one and a more uh, conservative one. And the uh, fight sometimes is um, harder when they belong to the same, uh, um, when they have the same ideology. In the Congress, Oh, no, nobody, nobody had dared to use some weapons, like nuclear weapons, like it was done at that time. And the only thing that we could do was to change rules. So this rule change had to be done. In Ecuador, for instance, Lucio Gutierrez Bucaram and others, well, Correa uh, uh, was another case, but uh, a new government promoted stability and made this process possible. And well, they changed constitution. I'm not defending their model, but probably we need to change some fundamental rules because, but with stability, well, we've had it. Very important message because what gives sustainability to the country and the possibility, uh, th that gives more, more sustainability to the country and uh, the country to take advantage of all these possibilities. Um, Minister of Foreign Affairs, going back to our, uh, the problems in Argentina, and in fact, congratulations, because you have renewed the terms of agreement with the monetary fund, and this makes it easier from a financial point of view and makes the landscape a bit clearer. Argentina, these recent years, was trying to uh, uh, align with the BRICS and the a uh, new development bank, so a position that was not as near the traditional financial market. So what is the strategy now? How do you uh, see this uh, uh, um, integration to the BRICS, and how do you see your coming back to the inter uh, international financial uh, markets? Well, Argentina has declined the invitation to participate in the BRICS um, from January onwards. Uh, we studied the, the the question, but it was not an economic issue. It was a political issue. Argentina wants uh, uh, to have a multilateral approach. We have already um, trade ties with all the BRICS countries. So from a trade point of view, it didn't add anything for us. I'm going to mention <laughs> a, a funny anecdote. We to, to say yes, but not yet, we had to send five letters because BRICS as such does not exist. It's a loose association, uh, friends that have a letter of intention, very, very detailed one, but where there is nothing specific. So we had to send a country to each president to uh, um, thank them for the invitation. But what can we or must we do? What Mr. Guimarães was saying, uh, renewable energies, for instance, look at the examples that he was giving. It's cases that are very capital intensive sectors that really industries that are very capital intensive and they are location bounded. You cannot move. If you want to have ethanol, ethanol with uh, um, corn, well, you need to do it there. In Argentina, we have the same uh, uh, landscape. We can make investments. There are people who have experience, others that have technology, others that have others that have the markets, and we could work. Uh, for instance, with Brazil, for Brazil is an example because they have developed what we want to do. There are other examples, not related to any specific issue, but we're trying to, for instance, revitalize, a little, give a little bit more adrenaline to Mercosur. We're working with four countries, and, and now uh, 
shortly with Bolivia. We're trying to sign an agreement with the European Union uh, at a pace which is um, not as uh, fast as we would like, and we have potential agreements with other countries. Of course, we have a different uh, viewpoint, and those countries that were very comfortable or even frustrated because they couldn't go on, because Mercosur has unanimity rules that are very strict, and now we agree that we need to uh, go forward. Of course, each country defending its own interests, but we have lots of things to do there. So the the Mm, the fact of belonging to one or other association is not what interests us. But yes, we what, what we want to do is to trade with everybody and not to uh, mix political issues and economic issues. So, from a long time, Argentina's government has decided when, how, and with whom to trade and what to buy, what to sell. All that has disappeared in these um, and the 30 and these uh, this last month so everything will take a bit of time but we are no longer under a uh, managed trade the state has to provide clear rules but from a political standpoint well there will be changes but not on trade well the news about Mercos who were very interesting no 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 wait a bit <laughs> don't rush of course, but it's necessary to give a priority to the Mercosur and to strengthen the relationship with the uh, European Union. It's very important. Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the uh, uh, European Commission, has talked about the uh, agreement signed with Chile and what that means for the lithium production. Production Argentina has huge reserves, uh, so it can benefit from those opportunities. Uh, trying to uh, give an added value producing or, or processing in Latin America in the uh, mineral ore and not exporting them raw. But these are the opportunities that uh, can appear with the Mercosur Agreement. Hopefully, it will be a reality. Um, Governor, going back to the state of Baja California and Mexico, you've just launched a strategy to uh, strengthen foreign investment, you have already talked about the um, sectors where you, that you're highlighting. And I would like to ask you what kind of investments you need, uh, a state needs to uh, do, for instance, Baja California in this case, to uh, materialize this potential in infrastructure or how the uh, private sector role is uh, seen um, regarding investments. And I'm asking this question because I know that you're a very important part in Morena. And we know that investments and infrastructure and energy and transportation, the private sector investment have always, investments have always uh, had difficulties. How do you see this from a state point of view? Well, most of the investments are private in our countries. We, uh, in, in Baja California, uh, during the two years, uh, I'm in office, we have invested what three previous administrations had, more than 8 billion uh, uh, pesos invested in infrastructure, and that is key. If we talk about nearshoring and development and growth in our state, we need to invest uh, on infrastructure. The federal government is making huge investments. They are uh, um, building in Tijuana, in Baja California, uh, the mm, most important terminal in the world. It's, uh, uh, it has uh, the latest technology because we need, of course, with our, in our trade with the United States, we need uh, these, uh, this technology. We are developing also Punta Gamet, that is a harbor, and it's a development that's being carried out now. So in Baja California, many things are going on. Uh, there is investment, public investment, private investment. The logistics uh, issue is very, very important. And in all the border uh, ports or harbors, well, the federal government is doing something. In Baja California, uh, Tijuana, Tecate, Mexicali. Mexicali has three uh, ports uh, in Tijuana. Tijuana, we have San Isidro, Otay, and the one that is almost finished, Otay Dos. Now, what we need is uh, for the United States to uh, do the job, too, do their part of the job. 
uh, two years ago, this was one of the main requirements. They were telling us, uh, they, they told us, you're a bit late. So thanks to President Lopez Obrador and the work that has been carried out, well, the Mexican part has been done almost. Uh, but the, uh, state, the United States has still to do their part. And as a, a governor, um, I've also contributed to this. We are 7 million inhabitants living in this great region, region of Calibaja. And we're promoting, as I said before, all of this. And the first uh, uh, item, the first point is talent in Baja California and resilience. The resilience uh, of our state to adapt ourselves uh, uh, to the changes uh, on a global level and taking advantage of the nearshoring with all the characteristics in Baja California. Uh, all the studies say that the cities in the north are the um, most um, suitable for uh, nearshoring. But now in the south, cities are also um, taking advantage of these uh, global dynamics. Uh, thank you. Luis Enrique, one of the activities that COSAN is carrying out, the, the company that you've uh, led till last December, is biofuels. So let's focus on biofuels and the opportunities that this represent in the midst of um, energy transition, uh, job generation, and of course, there are opponents to uh, biofuels because they say that this has expanded the agricultural uh, borders and it has a negative impact on biodiversity. How, how do you see the balance on uh, between opportunities and risks linked to biofuels? Experience as a company, as a country on, on, on biofuels. And I think the idea of an orderly transition, energy transition, that we've been working very hard is around what we call drop-in solutions, right? So if you look at the whole infrastructure of energy in the world, it's very complex, very capital intensive, and has been there for, for a long time. So the best way we see is to use as drop-in solutions. So the ethanol in Brazil has 27% content on the gasoline, and you can buy at the pump 100%. So it's the only country in the world, basically, where the consumer has at the pump the choice of fuel he wants to, to go. If you go 100% ethanol, you go gasoline with 27% content. And we learned that with that, we've been able to create the infrastructure to distribute the 100% ethanol because of the gasoline. If we have jumped straight to 100% ethanol, which was the first pro-alcohol that didn't went well in Brazil, is because you create the infrastructure for flex fuels with the cars and the flex infrastructure for that. And India, for example, is now following that with 12% content of ethanol on the gasoline going to 20%. So our experience that you start with the drop-in, you create a specific category for the consumers that want to, to be greener, and then you build up other products. So we started with first-generation ethanol. Now we are at second-generation ethanol. So Haizen, which is the company that's a joint venture with Shell that Kozan uh, invests, it has already construction of nine plants in a row. So because we dominated the technology, and now we can use all the bagasse and all the leaves to produce second-generation ethanol. It has a much lower carbon footprint, which you can export a big market for is Europe. So we're exporting 100% of the production of these new plants in Brazil. And we see from that the opportunity to go to other sectors. So the, the obvious sector for ethanol is mobility. But we are seeing now chemicals. We are seeing now food. We are seeing now all the other sectors that are looking for decarbonization using fossil fuels as the basically carbon, using now green carbon through ethanol to get there. Just to give another example, we are testing in Sao Paulo on the university the conversion from ethanol to hydrogen. Because mm -hmm. what's the biggest challenge for hydrogen? Mm -hmm. It's transport and storage. When you have ethanol and you have the infrastructure Brazil has, you can move ethanol around the country and put very close to the consumption. And, do, and do through a reformer, you can extract hydrogen and, and fuel a fleet of buses in the city or can fuel a car or can fuel an industry like a steel industry to, 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 re, to, to reduce their carbon footprint. The other thing we are seeing a big progress in Brazil is biomethane. So for every liter of the ethanol that you produce, you, you produce, produce 12 liters of vinhas, which is basically water with uh, organic content. By biodigesting that, you produce biomethane that can either put on the network of natural gas to mix again, put 1%, 2%, you keep going, so natural gas gets cleaner and stay longer 
because this what's going to happen in, in any way, or are you transforming in electricity through using engines to produce electricity and put on the grid? So we've been investing and we transform what were the old mills, old sugar cane mills, which are very old in Brazil, mm -hmm. and now in modern bioparks, which has first generation ethanol, sugar, second generation ethanol, electricity through the bagasse, biogas, and pellets. So we're also doing pellets to export to, to countries in Europe that they can mix with coal and reduce again the footprint. So I think the whole thing we learn is that biofuels is the best friend of the fossil fuels because give the fossil fuels a longer life and at the same time reduce foot footprint now. It's not big projects for the future. Now we can reduce now and you can predict progressive growth. The demand is there. So just keep converting over time. Puedo agregar algo? Bueno, por supuesto. Can I add something? Yes. What Argentina, Argentina could do exactly the same thing, but because we had price controls for such a long time where energy, uh, hydrocarbon energy cost uh, less than one third of its real cost, it was n no business to make bioethanol uh, because who would like to do that? But now, thanks to the new law that hasn't yet been approved in Congress, now we deregulate and uh, bioethanol can now compete. Prices have already been de deregulated on December 29th, and it was really uh, painful because prices have tripled in one week. So imagine, huh? uh, you have prices, you have problems in Europe with a six or eight percent increase. Imagine 300 percent. But uh, now you need just one thing to add: uh, feed for cattle. From one hectare of corn or sugar, we can also produce meat with a high protein content. So it's a very important idea. Um, Brazil did not have price controls, so they had an industry. They could develop an industry. Yes, that's the eternal uh, problem of uh, subsidies. And Mr. Caputo said it clearly when he introduced his measures. What people are not paying in buses, they end up paying it in um, supermarkets. So it's very clear. And now that we're talking about this, people are asking themselves here in Davos and at, uh, in the world, what will the reaction be uh, at the Congress in Argentina uh, in the face of all these reforms? Will President Millet be able to uh, get to achieve a majority uh, to uh, transform all these proposals in a reality. What is the view that you have from the government uh, of the political process at the Congress in Argentina? Well, our impression is that we don't have any doubt uh, if it's going to be approved or not. Probably not as soon as we would like to, because there are n we're not putting obstacles. We're just uh, eliminating uh, restrictions and as a matter of fact, we are introducing two packs. One decrees uh, focused on uh, individual uh, freedom. Uh, people have the possibility of doing, of carrying out activities if they want to uh, do so. And in the uh, uh, act that has more than 300 pages, we are deregulating lots of sectors for them to carry out many more activities. For instance, biofuels, that's one of the cases. but. Uh, there's also fishing, for instance. So there's always something that's being deregulated for it to happen, for it to, uh, for, uh, for it to allow it to happen. We don't know if it will. But why the Congress, uh, why should the Congress oppose to something that is more freedom? All the campaign against Millet was he will uh, destroy uh, education. No, it's the first time where um, Education will be free. This is the first time where uh, it's been written down, it's going to be free. So it's very hard to think that the Congress won't want to deregulate, except if there's a lobby from a particular sector that wants to protect uh, some people. But for instance, um, their companies can uh, bid if even if they have already uh, bid in the past. So we're seeing here a political uh, turmoil, not a, a deep turmoil. Okay, uh, of course, this depends on a lot of factors, but the constitutionality of the decree, 
you call it general unified decree, right? Well, of course, the decree is absolutely constitutional. All of the decrees, there have been thousands of decrees in Argentina, have always been constitutional. You can object to one aspect. For the time being, the only one that has been objected to uh, are, is the labor part. But it's not um, a restriction uh, freedom. Um, they give the uh, workers the opportunity of choosing if they want to uh, be members of a uh, um, trade union or not. That's all. Well, and the scenario will probably be a, a rejection from the court. OK. We only have four minutes left, one minute for each of you. Let's go back to the topics that we have dealt with in this session, but with a, a view more focused on Latin America. The situation in Latin America is not a bad one. It's even better than what was uh, projected a year ago. The economies have well performed. It's not optimum, but it's fine. What is lacking in Latin America to uh, be real uh, uh, important players have important growth rates and uh, to go more than this to, to achieve more than this three percent which is quite mediocre huh? but some countries consider it to be a nice figure let's start with Julio well I'm gonna give you an example in the 70s America was Asia through was three times Asia and now we are a third so we've regressed a lot. Argentina is one of the countries that has most suffered from that. Now, we, I think that we need reforms and uh, the integration of public services, education. Argentina had the best education uh, 100 years ago than the rest of the world. And 30 years ago, it had a very good public school. But in um, the uh, recent PISA study, the results were dreadful. So there needs to be an effort, and not only to overprotect uh, teachers and doctors, uh, also protect uh, sick people and, and, and pupils, students. I think that most of the countries in the region have a governance problem, and I'm talking about quality of public services. OK, you are a real uh, uh, prudent uh, governor of a central bank. Minister, yes. Uh, I think that in Latin America, with the decree and the law, we're, what we're giving are incentives and not punishments. There are no more restrictions. If you uh, eliminate punishments and uh, go uh, incentives, things will go better. Yes, and more so in countries with uh, so uh, huge natural resources and others like Argentina. Luis Enrique, from a business point of view. I think, this, uh, I think Latin America has, has have waves of that. I think if you keep consistent, keep the rules there, the, the private sector, as you said, with the resource that every country here has plenty of resource, different ones and complementary, we're going to get there. We cannot, I, I, I say, we cannot lose this wave of energy transition and decarbonization. This is the opportunity for Latin America. We don't have wars. We don't have a conflict with anyone. We go well with everyone. We need to, to do that. We need to be a, a, a birth for attracting investments for the new industry, the near shoring, hydrogen, biofuels, mining, and, and let the world benefit from that. Yes, and I would. Uh, end up saying that one of the challenges in Latin American countries and all the world is the migration issue. We still have to uh, give importance to the social welfare and investments there for all these people that live in a context of human mobility. And in Mexico, it's the case too. When people get to our border, uh, and of course, uh, Many things have been said here, but I think it's of the utmost importance uh, that as Latin American that we are, uh, we support these uh, people. It's uh, uh, an issue that uh, something that happens in Latin America and in the rest of the world. Well, we have covered all the topics and the times. I'm an optimistic about Latin America. I think that Latin America has now one of the best opportunities uh, to succeed. And the, uh, problems of the world, Latin America has not produced them. 
It's not uh, problems that we are aggravating, no. Rather, we can have a very important part. We can play an important role in the solution of these problems. Uh, they can be opportunities to increase our production, to have uh, more uh, capacity to generate uh, clean energies, to uh, feed the world. And in the geopolitical uh, arena, um, in the midst of uh, global tensions, to be a reliable ally, uh, a true ally. We don't generate conflicts. We don't generate wars and those uh, uh, kinds of problems. So we need to be aware of this huge opportunity. We need to take advantage of it. Uh, we don't have to repeat the mistakes of the past. And in the future, in these meetings, in Davos, uh, Latin America should be the region which helps uh, most to solve the uh, complex and multiple problems that we have in the world. Thank you very much.